founder of Tornado Cash. It's an open source Ethereum mixing wallet, like Samurai Wallet or Wasabi, which is, uh, you know, has, has already kind of, uh, you know, started to become OFAC compliant and blacklisting certain addresses. Um, you know, these are just ultimately like a collaborative Bitcoin transaction. People that call it a coin, you know, mix, mixing uh, solution or whatever they, they try to call it, right? Um, to, to try to criminalize it. It's just a Bitcoin transaction. It's just a collaborative spend. And that's just information. So like, you know, the kind of, the, uh, you know, you could, you could make an argument that it's kind of like against free speech in a way, but I, I you know, the state's not going to really accept that. Uh, but it's just, it's just not a good precedent. The founder, you know, just a builder of software had his, is, is getting potentially canceled because he created something that, you know, the U.S. government didn't like. And they, you know, they blamed Korean, uh, you know, Korean, the, I don't even know what the, 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 the treasury guy tweeted out. It was pretty ridiculous, but just a, just a pretty important day in general and not great for, you know, the, the privacy movement in general, but we've known it's been coming. We've, we've known that. So you know, just a matter of time. So I want to play devil's advocate and I'm not, I'm not asking this question because I think any action is justified. I am just a vehicle to share a different idea. Um, let's ignore the tornado cash, but let's say this actually happened to Do Kwan or to Mashinsky. Would your feelings be different? Well, let's, I mean, let's, let's distinguish, you know, a fraud, Alex Machinsky, uh, and think what you want about, you know, whether Do Kwan was building something earnest or knew it was, you know, all a Ponzi all along, not going to make that call here. Um, but in terms of what, you know, Alex Machinsky and Celsius did, it was fraudulent. Um, and so it's different than someone just building software. It's non-custodial, like, like Tornado Cash is a non-custodial Ethereum mixer. You send in a transaction, it's, a, I don't really know the exact technicals as well as I do with Bitcoin and mixing. But you send in Ethereum and it's, it's a smart contract and it executes and, you, and it mixes it up and you can't tell what's the input, what's the output is the base of it. And sorry if I bundled the response a little bit. You know, the, the, the Roman uh, Semenov, he doesn't actually touch the Ethereum, the, the founder of or the, you know, the creator of this software. Right. So like, again, and there's this like kind of really petty like ETH BTC, like, you know, flame war going on where, you know, all this hype around the merge and potentially, you know, the dot ETH Twitter cult will, you know, go against the, the Bitcoin maximalist Twitter cult. Like it's all, it's all pretty dumb. And I think it's missing the bigger point that uh, a clampdown is coming. Um, and, you know, whether Ethereum has its, has its merits or is, you know, kind of riding on the backs of Bitcoin is anybody's judge. I align probably more with the max, maximalist Bitcoin maximalist viewpoint. Um, but screeching that everything is a scam over the past decade hasn't really served anyone well or protected anybody people still go for the scams. And so maybe like we Bitcoiners should fine tune their message a little bit. Um, even though like I, I'm pretty bearish on all the other altcoins against Bitcoin relative, you know, relatively over the next year, five years, 10 years. Um, I don't, I think Ethereum is tremendously overvalued at 50% of Bitcoin's market cap, but it doesn't mean, I, I think that, you know, calling for more regulation into the labeling of Ethereum as a security is just probably the wrong way to go about it. Um, to keep bringing it back here. Yeah, so I guess to go back to your question, Q, like, is it justified if it was like some fraudulent activity or Mashinsky or something like that they're shutting down? I guess it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you do it for one, you're going to constantly find, you know, the gray area to do it more and more. And, I, you know, it just gets back to the point that it's just two different systems completely and are, and are always going to be um, because stable coins are going to be larger centralized issuers, no matter what chain, whether it's Tron or Ethereum that they're on, they're going to run into those issues. They still operate. I mean, stable coins by definition are just, you know, a, a blockchain dollar version of the financial system that we have today. So, you know, I don't think it really matters in terms of punishing, whether it's for the illegal activity or not. I think it's just that now when you think of like in Bitcoin terms and the innovation, what it's meant to be is that, that you're going to have so many conversations if bitcoin's successful over the years and so many issues with trying to shut down rails for all sorts of reasons from a system that the united states has had or the western world really has had very strong financial control over that they're going to be you know essentially losing that power and they're not going to be wanting to give that up in any such way so again you know it's just like one probably very small example whether i think it was you know 
uh, kind of North Korean money laundering that's going to come up. And I, probably many are going to fight and say, you know, that's that's very justifiable to, you know, shut that down. And it just goes back to the censorship resistant um, kind of capabilities of all this. And and are those and, and what's truly like censorship resistant and when Bitcoin, you know, grows and it scales um, and it's in these situations, is it going to prove that it's really truly censorship resistant? I mean, that's probably me to me, like the largest risk, how much influence over, you know, governments and businesses between blacklisting addresses and, you know, trying to shut down some sort of like circular economy here, how much are they going to be able to do? Uh, and how much are the tools on Bitcoin going to be able to withstand that? I think on this, on this note, it's pretty interesting. Like, you know, all the macro craziness we've seen uh, over the last, the last year, I'm not just talking about like financially, but the, the geopolitical tension that's increasingly being built with the United States and China, uh, and just and just all of the you know like the sanctioning of, of treasury reserves, we're a long long ways away from Bitcoin being anything from a, than a you know shortfall asset a 24/7 365 inverse VIX, right? S and P ticks down or up, Bitcoin is just beta on that, and it's just kind of this reflection of the liquidity tide and you know all the, that that extra speculation you know kind of sloshing around. Uh, but once Bitcoin is you know if we if we do reach this point of like you know, Bitcoin's at 500,000. It's, it's, you know, kind of equivalent to gold, uh, even, even bigger than that. Bitcoin becomes liquid enough um, for, you know, it becomes the enemy of monies, but not at a, a level of drug dealers and, uh, you know, you know, small speculators now, like it is, like it was in 2011 and like it is now in 2022, but in say 2020, whatever, right? How, however long it takes, it's going to be liquid enough for nations, adversarial nations to hold it in their reserves as a, as a treasury asset. Um, at the at the largest level, like so, you know, sovereign, you know, Bitcoin mining, and and the reality that the game theory of digital money, and and you know, not not your keys, not your coins at a nation state level is like, you know, not your central bank reserves, <laughs> you know, it's like it's not your system. And ultimately, I think people, the game theory of Bitcoin long term is that people, institutions, and eventually sovereigns are going to opt into something that, where they they have the rules, like you know in their favor with, with whether, you know, it's absolute scarcity, uh, rising production cost, uh, and, and, you know, you get to decide that there's no more than 21 million coins by running your own software. And the, the bet on Bitcoin is the bet that people converge upon that because there's no other alternative. It's an, you can't use USDC and you can't use USTs, US treasuries, if you're Russia or China, right? Say, what if China invades Taiwan? And I'm not going to pretend and LARP here and like I'm some geopolitical expert and know what Xi Jinping's going to do with Taiwan. I don't know, but I do know that that the the trend of you know in, increasing hostility between you know the biggest the biggest institutions and, so, and sovereigns on the planet is going to increase, and the trust in it, you know this this international monetary order that has been built up uh, you know for the last really 80 years since Bretton Woods, uh, and and if you look you know. Post 1971, that order became free float fiat currencies. It's this experiment. We're really only 51 years into it. And so what happens when all of this, you know, kind of boils to a head and, and you see, you know, massive competitive debasement uh, and the kind of fraying of, of this international monetary order, which we've arguably started to see over the last two years at an increasing pace and probably in the next three to five well, Bitcoin probably is is there, right? So, like, I mean, I'm pretty short-term bearish. I think equities have a leg down, um, you know, and that we still haven't seen the biggest you know, volatility event uh, in this financial meltdown. But on the topic of like, you know, censorship resistance, uh, it's it's really, I think, one of the biggest bull cases is thinking about that geopolitical game theory, looking why gold itself failed as global money, um, and really, you know, global money between sovereigns at the biggest level, why that failed, and why that trust. To, you know that link that relationship failed and then look into bitcoin and or, or really anything look into bitcoin look into ethereum look into usdc you know and, and evaluate really every asset on the planet in terms of what's going to you know fill this this kind of need this global need for for a neutral reserve asset and like my my bet my my you know conclusion is bitcoin but that's me personally so you know i guess everyone has to make that for themselves but that's you know kind of my thesis here